Please open your Bibles this morning to Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. At Balfour, we affirm the truth of 2 Timothy 3.16, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Got a question for you this morning. What did you read in God's Word this week? The Bible says in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. What did you memorize in God's word this week? The Bible says in Psalm 119, 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Let's pray together this morning. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, we thank you that he is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Father, we pray for the first responders on their way to this emergency. Lord, we pray you'd give them traveling mercies, and we pray, Lord, you would aid and assist those they are going to help. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have, Lord, to assemble ourselves together on this day, the Lord's day. Father, I thank you that we have the opportunity to rejoice and be glad in you each and every day. Father, I pray that as we open up your word, Lord, that you, by the very power of your spirit, will draw the lost to yourself, Lord. I pray that you would open up their eyes, Lord, to how they have sinned against you, Lord, and they will look unto Jesus and be saved. Father, I pray for your church, Lord. I pray that you would strengthen us as we look to this example in the text, Lord, of Paul, your ambassador in chains. Father, I pray that you would build up your church in a mighty way for the days, Lord, that I believe which your word teaches that we are heading toward, Lord, that we are already in, Lord, where we must have a boldness, Lord, where we must be able to speak and make known the gospel, Lord, not even considering the consequence that may be imposed upon us for doing so. Lord, I pray you would build up and strengthen your church. Lord, I pray that you would use me Lord, a weak vessel to communicate this truth this morning. Father, I trust and know that your grace is sufficient. I pray, Lord, that you will make it perfect in my weakness. Lord, I pray that we would leave out of here this morning, Lord, just in awe of the Savior that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, look to your Bible, Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, and for me that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Our focus this morning will be on the first half of verse number 20. Let us walk through the text together with ears to hear and a heart to obey. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look to your Bible, verse number 20. For which I am an ambassador in chains. The phrase, for which reveals how Paul became an ambassador in chains. If you look back just to the previous verse, Paul is an ambassador in chains 
for making known the mystery of the gospel. Paul is an ambassador in chains for declaring the truth that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Look to your Bible, verse 20. For which I am an ambassador in chains. Notice the phrase, I am. The phrase, I am, points to Paul's present circumstance at the time this letter to the Ephesians was written. I want us to focus for a moment on the phrase, I am an ambassador. Now, Strong's defines ambassador as to be senior. By implication, act as a representative. It's used one other time in the New Testament. It really helps us understand what this word means. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.20, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Look at that verse there. As though God were pleading through us. An ambassador for Christ takes the message of the God of our Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he makes it known. He declares it. Paul was presently an ambassador for Christ when, in, when Ephesians was written. Now you may ask the question, was, has Paul always been an ambassador for Christ? Please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 7, verse number 54. Acts chapter 7, verse number 54. You may want to slide your bulletin in the book of Acts. We'll be coming back there a couple of times this morning. Acts chapter 7, verse 54. If you found your place, please say amen. We're first introduced to Paul in Acts chapter 7, verse 58. He's identified to us there by his Hebrew name, Saul. As we come into Acts chapter 7, we see Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, He's declaring to the religious council that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus, the one that they had murdered, was the Messiah who was promised in the Old Testament. He says in Acts 7, 52, Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you, know, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. Let's pick up beginning in verse number 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. That term, fell asleep, it's so comforting for a Christian. It's the term that's used to describe the death of a Christian. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. The Christian falls asleep. To be absent from the body is to be present, from, or to be present with the Lord. What a hope the Christian has. 
Let's continue and look at the first couple verses of Acts chapter 8. Now, Paul, now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. There we see the first example of Saul. Now, turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Not too far away from where we just were. If you found your place, please say amen. Paul summarizes what we're about to read in Acts chapter 9, and he does so in his first letter to Timothy. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 13, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. You see, the Apostle Paul, in his own words, says that he was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. A blasphemer is someone who speaks evil, generally directed toward God. Paul's blasphemy was evident in how he spoke of Jesus. The Acts of, of, uh, or excuse me, the Paul of Acts 8 denied that Jesus was the Christ the Son of the living God. The Acts, or the Paul, excuse me, of Acts 8, spoke slanderously of Jesus. A persecutor is one who pursues with the intent to harass and trouble. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. An insolent man is someone who commits violence, and abuse toward others. Look at what we just read in Acts 8, 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Now the Bible says here that Paul's persecution of the church was done ignorantly, in unbelief. Paul had previously rejected Jesus as Israel's Messiah. He was an unbeliever. He was ignorant toward Christ. So Paul saw his persecution of the church as being faithful to God. Paul, like each and every one of us, needed to be forgiven of his sin. Paul received forgiveness of sin. Paul received eternal life through the exceedingly abundant grace of our Lord. Have you received forgiveness of sin? Have you received everlasting life through the exceedingly abundant grace of our Lord? If you're wondering why this blasphemer, why this persecutor, why this insolent man received forgiveness, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 1.16, However, for this reason I obtained mercy. That in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. As we look to Paul's life, we see if God can save him, God can save anyone. Let's read in Acts chapter 9, beginning at verse number 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, 
What do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me, that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. And he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on the name in Jerusalem, and has come here for that purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength, and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. There's two concepts I want us to see here in Acts 9. The first is the boldness in which Paul preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Now, if the Lord wills, we shall look at that point next week. Second, I want us to see the Lord's words to Ananias concerning Paul. The Lord Jesus says, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, if you'll turn back in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Keep your spot there in the book of Acts. We'll be coming back shortly. But Ephesians chapter 6, I want us to look once again at verse 20. The Bible says, For which I am an ambassador in chains. Paul was not simply an ambassador. Paul was an ambassador in chains. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon are recognized as Paul's prison epistles. Now, I believe that these letters were written during Paul's captivity in Rome. Paul was there for two years, and he had a level of liberty afforded to him while he was there in Rome. The Bible says in Acts 28, 30 through 31, Then Paul dwelt... Two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Now in Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, Paul references his imprisonment. The Bible says in Ephesians 3.1, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, The Bible says in Ephesians 4.1, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. The Bible says in Philippians 1.7, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. The Bible says in Philippians 1, 12 through 13, But I want you to know, brethren, 
that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren of the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. The Bible says in Colossians 4.18, this salutation by my own hand, Paul, Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. Then lastly, the Bible says in Philemon 1, 8 through 11, Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I appeal to you for my own son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and me. Please turn back in your Bibles to Acts chapter 21, verse number 36. Acts chapter 21, verse number 26. I want us to see where I believe Paul's arrest took place and the events around that arrest. If you found your place, please say amen. Paul was returning back to Jerusalem, from coming back from one of his missionary trips. He and his companions encountered a prophet named Agabus. Agabus took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now Paul's companions plead with him to not go to Jerusalem. Paul said to them, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul's companions ceased when they saw that he could not be persuaded, and they said, the will of the Lord be done. Upon Paul's arrival in Jerusalem, he's urged to make peace with some of the Jews who were now believers in Christ. James and the elders informed Paul that there are believing Jews who have been informed about Paul that he teaches all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. Paul is urged in a demonstration of, I guess you'd say, unity to join with four men who had taken a vow. The elders said that those things of which they were informed concerning Paul are nothing but that he himself also walks orderly and keeps the law. So let's begin now in verse number 26. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. Now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia... Seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them, and when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains, And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded to be taken into the barracks. 
When he reached the stairs, he, he had to be carried by the soldiers because the, of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying out, Away with him. You continue down through the text. Paul asks the permission of the commander to speak to the people. He addresses them as brethren and fathers. He proceeds to give them a testimony of how he encountered the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. The crowd listens to him until Paul comes to the point and he declares that he had been sent by Jesus to the Gentiles. At that point, the commander orders that Paul be examined by scourging, meaning he was to be beat so they could get to the bottom of things. It's at that point Paul reveals that he is a Roman citizen. And the beating does not begin. The next day, Paul addresses the religious council. He sees an opportunity to divide the Sadducees and the Pharisees when he tells them that he is being judged concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead. Paul is placed into the barracks to be held. At that point, the Bible says in Acts 23, 11, but the following night, The Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. The commander is informed that more than 40 men have bound themselves by an oath that they would not eat or drink until they had killed Paul. And they're waiting for Paul. So the commander sends Paul to Governor Felix by night. Then the high priest and the elders make their way to Felix. They bring the accusation that Paul is a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world. Paul responds by saying that the high priest and the elders cannot prove the things of which they now accuse him. The Bible says in Acts 24, 14 through 16, but this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. Paul then once again drills down to the real reason of their accusations. He says that he is being judged concerning the resurrection of the dead. I am being judged by you this day. Two years pass and Portius Festus succeeded Felix. The Bible tells us that Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. Festus asked Paul if he's willing to go up to Jerusalem to be judged. The Bible says in Acts 25, so Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you very well know. For if I am an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar." in fulfillment of the very promise the Lord Jesus made to him. Jesus kept his word. Paul would now go to Rome, and he would stand before Caesar. Before Paul departs Caesarea, he's giving one last opportunity to make known the mystery of the gospel. As he presents it to King Agrippa and Bernice, he tells them, Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand witnessing both the small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Then Agrippa, a man who was very familiar with the Old Testament, he says to Paul, You almost persuade me to become a Christian. Paul's final words 
to those assembled before he was sent to Rome are recorded in Acts 26, 29. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. The Apostle Paul was an ambassador in chains for making known the mystery of the gospel, for declaring that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The question is, why would that declaration put him in chains? If the gospel is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, why does the gospel offend in the way that it's offend? Why do so many find the gospel offensive? The Bible says in Romans 1.17, for, for in it, this is the gospel, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, I will offer four words as to why I believe so many are offended by the gospel. These four words are four words that I keep in my mind as I'm sharing the hope of Christ with others. They keep bringing me back to the truths of Scripture. The reason I believe the gospel, so many are offended by the gospel, is because of God, man, Christ, and a response. Keep those four words in mind as you think about this. God, man, Christ, response. You see, the gospel demands that we look unto God. God is the creator of everything. The Bible says in Genesis 1.27, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible says in Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female. He created them. God is holy. The Bible says in 1 John 1.5, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. A holy God requires perfect obedience to his holy law. The Bible says in James 2.10, Forever shall keep the whole law, and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. You see, the gospel demands that we look unto God. Second, the gospel demands that we look at man, specifically ourselves. We have broken God's good and holy law. The Bible says in Romans 3, 10 through 12, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. The Bible says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is at this very point so many will reject the gift of God. They will stand there holding up their good works in a hopeless attempt to find atonement for their sin. Man cannot be saved by good works. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. See, the gospel demands that we look unto God. The gospel demands that we look, unto our, we look at ourselves. The gospel demands that we look unto Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah who was promised in the Old Testament. It is Jesus who is Emmanuel, God with us. It is Jesus who came to earth to save his people from their sins. It is Jesus who died for our sins. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, 
And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It is Jesus who not only died for our sins, but who rose from the grave and is alive today. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The very hope of eternal life rests on the reality of a risen Lord Jesus. The gospel demands that we look unto God. The gospel demands us to look at ourselves. The gospel demands that we look unto Christ. And then finally, the gospel demands that we respond. Because when you hear the message of the gospel, each person has a choice. They will either receive the Lord Jesus Christ or they will reject the Lord Jesus Christ. You must receive the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let's return now to Ephesians 6 as we close and look at the first part of verse 20. For which I am an ambassador in chains. There are two types of people. There are ambassadors for Christ, those who have been saved from their sin, and they have been commissioned by King Jesus to bring the gospel to their families, to their neighborhood, to their communities, to the nations. And there are those who need to repent and believe the gospel. To those needing to repent and receive the gospel, I implore you, On Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. If you're here this morning and you're separated from God due to your sin, the very promise from God is this. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. God will save you right now by his grace. There's no works on your part. Those who are ambassadors for Christ, those who have been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a new creation. Behold, All things, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When God saved you, he gave you the ministry of reconciliation. Make known the mystery of the gospel. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. As you take this commission that your king has given you, to you. Do so mindfully of what the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Don't be caught off guard as you seek to make known the mystery of the gospel, that the world hates it. The world hates it because they must look unto God, they must look at themselves, they must look at the Christ, and they must respond. They don't want to hear it. It doesn't change the commission our king has given to us. Make known the mystery of the gospel. Be an ambassador to proclaim the truth that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. As you do this, remember the very words of our king. He said in Matthew 28, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, 
I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's a promise from your king. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. As we take some time this morning to respond to God's word as the piano plays, take this opportunity to pray. Obey the words of Hebrews 4.16 and come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you that we can come to you just as we are. Lord, we don't have to clean ourselves up to, to approach you. Lord, if, we, if we're coming to you for salvation, Lord, we can look to the thief on the cross. Lord, place our faith and trust in you. Lord, and then you will sanctify us. Lord, you will wash us. Lord, you will clean us. Father, if we're a believer, Lord, who has drifted away, Lord, if the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life have begun to draw our attention and our affection away from you, Lord, you promise us in your word that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, I thank you for your grace. Lord, I thank you that it is exceedingly abundant. Father, I pray that you would build up and strengthen your church that as we leave out of these doors, Lord, we would recognize that we are an ambassador for you. Lord, help us as we go about our day-to-day -day lives that we would, uh, we would plead with others, Lord, to be reconciled to you. Lord, help us to do this in a culture that doesn't want to hear it, just like in the Apostle Paul's day. Lord, but we must proclaim the gospel and not be ashamed of it, Lord, because it is the power of salvation to all who will believe. Lord, strengthen and build us up as a church that we would remain faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen.